So I just thought I'd start in advance by thanking you for your time, patience, tolerance. Um, <laughs> Aisha and I were, were talking earlier, and we thought it would be interesting to um, get the ball rolling really fast. And um, and he wanted to read a, read a, a section from his book. Yeah, I was actually going to show some images, but that didn't work out today. So figure we'll <clears throat> take from the entropy of bones. Uh, the main character is a. Um, African-American Mongolian girl who kicks butt and takes numbers. Um, and um, there's not much to really set up here. This may sound a bit familiar to some people. A moron of an undertrained Oakland police officer had fired a gun point blank range at a 22-year-old Oakland kid who was unarmed and handcuffed face down and black. The cop was white and lived in the rich suburbs of Antioch. The kid lived in a part of Oakland known as the Bottoms. The cop's excuse was that he thought he was pulling his taser. Oakland wasn't buying it, but the jury did. They gave the cop the lightest sentence possible. Oakland answered by lighting its streets on fire. That's what the news report said, at least. In truth, it wasn't the mourners of the dead Bottoms kid or the righteous anger of the Oakland protesters that started lighting garbage cans on fire. It was bandana-faced Trustafarians who got off calling themselves anarchists alongside the usual opportunistic infection-type people that availed themselves of whatever tragedy they can find to grab whatever they can find. They were the ones who maintained the chaos in the streets. In response, the Oakland Police Department strapped on their riot gear and swung for the fences, trying desperately to maintain whatever crumbs of order they could find. Of course, I knew none of this at the time. I just walked out of my first and only high school party and found a full-scale riot jumping off. Party's over. If anyone wondered how they could hear me over the music, they didn't bother asking. They were all following instructions, packing up, and figuring out how to get out of the sandwich shop, except for the little kid. What the hell, he yipped at me as I went up to his balcony. Riot, big time, all downtown by the smell of the fire. He understood quickly enough and killed the music just as the sound of the breaking wood from the beer garden behind him made me jump. Only I leapt off the small back window and onto the second floor balcony to see the beer garden. A skinny dread anarchist had already made his way over by the time I landed. His friend was trying to make it over the fence as well. I let his ass meet my knee. You're not welcome here, I whispered as I threw him back over the fence. Freaking pigs are everywhere, the remaining white dread moaned as I stepped off the keg, resting on the balls of my feet softly. Your problem, not mine. The smell of his fear came in waves, almost mask masking the smell of the burning tires from Franklin Street. You get one chance to leave here on your own. He did not choose wisely. Back inside, nine mathletes and debaters formed a circle around the little kid. They'd been smart enough to lock the front door and turn off all the lights. The front, the front gate to the plate glass window shop had already been locked down. Across the street, we saw a troop of helmeted, baton-wielding police officers making their way from the headquarters to the border of Jack London Square to the main riot in front of City Hall. Did I stutter the first time? Go home. The they were going to stay here, the little kid stepped up as the others retreated. Uh, riot equals change of plans, no? Where are we going to go? A mousy girl who made me ashamed to be female cried. Bryce called. He said some of the others had been attacked. Bart is closed. They all told their parents they were going to stay out all night at each other's houses, but we were going to spend the night here, kind of like a sleepover. We even have sleeping bags. Oh, for the love of all things non-nerd, I beg you to stop talking. <laughs> I looked at them in earnest for the first time. They were the last of the 200 who had come, and the first, the intelligent outcast. They were new to fashion. They were as new to fashion as I was. It was a costume for them. For many, maybe all, it was their first night out. Around 190 bolted, and some paid the price. But these 10, plus the little kid, they had stayed loyal through the fidelity and the fear. With, little, with what little sentimentality I had to assert, I knew I would get them home. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the, um, with the obvious question is, why did you pick that passage? Because uh, we're in the Bay, and um, I love the Bay. Um, and I love Oakland. I love, I love an Oakland that I fear is, uh, is, is disappearing. Um, I feel like the Bay that I love is disappearing. Um, and you know, I, you know, I'm not, there's a, there's a POC line, only in Cali do we riot and not rally. And um, I just love 
I love that we rioted. I love that there was a time when we stood up and just said no. And yeah, there are politics with it, and yeah, there's drama with it, and people did stupid things, but there was a point where we said no, and now we're saying okay. And now we're not saying anything. And now we're forgetting to speak. And that, uh, I don't like that. So, <laughs> um, you know, a good thing about a novel or about a book is you get to hold on to a moment, and um, that's a moment for me, a moment where we said no. Well, and, and I'm, I'm really interested in that moment in particular because it's in the context of a series of novels, you know, yeah. the, um, the Liminal People, Liminal Wars, and Entropy of Bones that are about people with superhuman abilities. Um, and yet that's, that's in there. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you, you have a movie like, or, you know, even the book, like The Martian, you know, and it's like, you can talk about how much fuel it takes to get to Mars and biodomes and other scientific stuff that I'm not really sure about. But when it comes down to it, what's the story about? It's about a person trying to figure out how to get through their life, how to stay alive, how to survive. Um, and, you know, I lo that's a good story. And I think that story should be expanded out. And the people who get to survive should be expanded out. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm interested how an African-American Mongolian girl deals with the riots in Oakland when, peace, when police are going nuts. You know, I'm interested in how people of color survive this world when it's uh, pretty clear that there's a lot of things set up to say that we shouldn't. Well, also, I mean, going back to the world that this is, that this is a part of, yeah. Um, for for some of the people in the audience who haven't read all the books, how would you, what would you, do, how would you describe the series? Um, um, it's about a peop about a bunch of people who can do weird things, getting into some weird situations, making bad decisions, and coming out the other end of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, give it give an example of of, of weird things and bad decisions. Uh, if your God tells you not to go back in time, don't go back in time. <laughs> go back in time. If uh, your father figure is a sadistic weirdo that says that he wants, to, he wants you to find a girl that can control animals and bring him to her, the smart thing to do is to do that. <laughs> if you don't do that, then you have to deal with the consequences of that. And, I, and I, what I like writing about is the consequences. I like seeing what happens when people don't make the right decision, because I rarely make the right decision. <laughs> rarely. And, and that, that actually leads into um, something that we were discussing just before we came up here, yeah. um, where, I, where I half jokingly asked you, so when's that last book going to come, knowing <laughs> that that's like the, the worst question to ask anyone. Yeah. Um, Asked my parents who didn't get to talk to me for, for months when I was finishing my dissertation. Um, but you, you had some really interesting comments about like why you wanted to end, why you want the next book to be the last book in this. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, like the, they're novels, they're, they're not comics, and I love comics, and I'm working on a comic with uh, John Jennings, and it's going to be great and amazing, and it's going to change the whole face of the universe. But. Um, <laughs> You know, um, but they, but these are novels, and um, novels novels have ends. You know, I, it doesn't seem like that thanks to Harry Potter and every other series that has nine, ten, eleven, twelve books in the series. Um, but what I like about a novel is that there is a definitive end to it, and it's so tempting in this world. It's so rich. I can spin off a thousand and one different things in it again and again and again. But um, in the end, it comes down to uh, a family, and a family who has to make some um, rough choices and deal with the consequences. So once they've sort of made those big choices, in my mind, I want to give them that time to, to, to rest, to go away for a while. So you want the story to end for the family, but what about the world that you've created around them? You know, there's some other writing projects that I want to do, and um, it's I'm fortunate in that nobody knows who I am by and large. So like, there's not like this huge clamor of like, you know, I'll give you fifty thousand dollars for the next book, but if anybody will, then I'll write it right away. <laughs> I will totally do that. 
I will totally do that. But since nobody's asking for that, I have that freedom to be like, I get to say when this ends, you know, and that's, that's a rare thing for a writer. So I'm like, okay, this one's gonna be done. I'm gonna write some other stuff. I'm gonna take over the comic book world. And then when I'm done with that, if I wanna come back to the world, the world will still be there. You know, there's, there's still one dangling character that we don't see in the last book that can come back and cause trouble. Well, something that you've, you've kept coming back to also is family. And um, I've, read, I've read a recent interview where they asked you about your take on radical politics. And it even came up again what, in the, the passage that you read. Yeah. Could you talk a little more about sort of where you, what you see the role of radical politics in relationship to family? Yeah, I mean, I think family, I, uh, family, is, uh, family is not blood as far as I'm concerned. I, I'm not trying to tell anybody else how to live. But family is not blood, family is choice. Um, and the people that uh, choose to back me up, and the, some of them are in the audience, um, and the people that I choose to back up, that's my family. And it's, it's been that way from the beginning, and, and I don't really know another way to live. I don't care if you're my second cousin once removed because you, your great grandpa I had sex with my great uncle. That's not family. Family to me is like, I'm hungry, I'm poor, I'm starving, will you back me up? Yes, or I'm confused, I don't know what I'm doing, will you back me up? Yeah. So I have black family, I have white family, I have queer family, I have straight family, like, and it's not like different families, they're all, they're all linked, you know? And I, and you know, when you, and politics, when you hear it, when you hear in these political circles, I think everything's political, that's why I did the weird finger thing. Um, when you talk about politics and everybody's talking about family values, they're not even talking about my type of family, so how could they be talking about my values? You know what I mean? Like, um, a person who, in my mind, you know, is as close to a big brother, you know, father figure for me is in the hospital right now, and he's, um, you know, they're cool on insurance right now, but after 30 days, you know, they don't necessarily have insurance. I got tons of insurance that I never use. That's my family. Why can't he have my insurance? That's my, that's my politics around, around family values. But we're, in this country, we're so not even in that dialogue that I just stay out of the conversation by and large. Would you say that, um, that to the extent that you are in the conversation, that, it's, that it comes more through your writing? Um, and really weird Facebook post. <laughs> um, I just have some weird Facebook posts. Um, I mean, I'll come out publicly. I support Bernie Sanders. I don't know. I mean, I, my, I, I feel like how one lives is political. You know, like the, how you vote is interesting. How you live is political. How I live is political. So to the best of my ability, I try and live my politics. You know, I don't, I don't skirt the poor, you know, for I am the poor, you know, like I don't, um, you know, I work in education, I work in education as much as I can, you know what I mean, like my politics are my life, I just feel like they're connected. One thing I want to do is, that is um, I'd like to open it up to questions now, um, knowing that we'll probably come back to yeah. you know, asking questions Go for of it. each other, because I always like there to be more t I, I'd prefer there to be more time for questions than for, than for just dialogue between two people up on this stage with things in front of them. And I think she wants a, some people want cards. Okay, the first, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take questions also from people raising their hands, but I also had a question handed to me. Um, how does gender express itself in your writing? Uh, that's a good question. So a critique that I had on the first book was that it was very um, Madonna whore complected. Um, and I think that was true, but I think that was true of the character. Like that's the way that he saw the world. And so that's, that was his impact. Um, I think with Entropy of Bones, uh, it's, I didn't realize this is my first attempt to write a female character. Um, and as I wrote her, um, I found her gender expression to be uh, not, I, I found her gender expression, I, what I wanted to write was um, 
a woman, a young woman who hadn't been impacted by all the BS that I've seen so many young women impacted by, um, because of her skills, because of her training, she never felt, um, she never felt at the mercy of any man. And that creates a very different woman, young woman, than I've seen in most of my career. Um, so that's what I was trying to do in that book. And then um, Liminal War, the gender expressions generally tend to be uh, more like, just everybody's a badass. I don't know any other way of saying it. Like everyone's a badass in their gender. You know, like they they are they know who they are. They know what they want to do, and damn the consequences. Um, so, and I get you know, and one of the characters that I love, it's a minor character. Um, it's it's a black woman who owns a gin joint in uh, Louisiana in the 1930s, and I had to think about who that woman is, and that woman tolerates no shit from anyone. Um, and so it was really, I, I like badass women, okay, that's some, pretty much what I'm saying. I like badass women, um, and I think, um, yeah, you know, a, a really sort of a, a big politic in, in the first book was uh, there was a character, a uh, bad guy, who raped an, um, another character off scene, um, and I love that the main female character was like, there is no forgiveness for this. There's no walking around it. And she chops the dude in two. Well, and actually she explodes his brain. But like, it's just like that sort of like, nope, I'm not, there's no equivocating about this. I like those kinds of characters. I hope so. Yeah. Um, even in terms of your profession of working in education or being a writer, et cetera. And so the question that I have for you is what about how do people live their continue to live their politics when they're in situations where their politics are not necessarily reflected in their profession? Yeah. So you're working in a situation where like, you know, life is hard, you need the money, you need X, Y, Z, and you're doing something that doesn't necessarily agree and in fact possibly contradicts with your politics. Yeah. So just for the mic, for those that didn't hear, is how do you live your politics when your career path doesn't necessarily support that? Uh, first and foremost, I'm giving no advice to anyone. Live your life. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm making things up as I go along right now. Um, so that said, uh, two, I'm going to make an assumption here. You are a black woman? Yeah. OK. You identify as a black woman? You living your life as a healthy, happy person in San Francisco is a political act. Like, like, there are so few black people in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. Like, I'm surprised there's not a riot going on. There's too many black people here. Um, to be a happy, healthy black person in this country, like to, in this country, definitely in this uh, city, whatever it takes to do that, that's political. I love, I work in San Francisco and I can't stand coming here every day, but um, <laughs> when I see black people smiling in the street in San Francisco, <laughs> you did it. I think after that, it's like, you know, where's your energy? Like, you know, I'm not from that martyr complex of like, you have to suffer so that everybody else is happy because nobody's happy. You know what I mean? Like, it, just, it doesn't make sense. Like, the way, whatever ways that you can spread joy in your world and spread joy to other people, do that. Like, play, play your part. Do what you do and do what you do well. That's what I would say. This is one, I'm gonna do one of the, the next card. Um, you have th the titles of your three books, um, Liminal People, Entropy of Bones, and The Liminal War, yeah. The Liminal War, Liminal Wars. Um, what inspired you to give these titles their names? Ah, um, the title Liminal People comes from um, a book, Black Skins, White Mask by Franz Fanon. 
Um, and if you haven't read it, you should. Um, I will say that. I've read that book probably once a year from the time I was like 10 uh, till now. Um, and in it, um, talking about the post-colonial subject, so um, that individual liberated yet not free from uh, colonial mentality, he says that, that is a liminal, we are liminal people. We are people in an in-between space. Um, and so that, that line always stuck with me, and I was like, okay, so you know, go big, I say, what's like a broad, what's broadly liminal? And, um, you know, the notion of humanity, because connected in that liminal space that Fanon is talking about is this notion of what it means to be human. And that was an idea that only, you know, the colonist had, that the colonist was human and that they were dealing with these subhuman subjects. I mean, 1463, the, you know, Catholic Church says that those of African descent are you know, are not fully ensouled. I love that term, because then it gets sold. Anyway, um, but are not fully ensouled, and as a result, it's okay to enslave us. But, so we're not human. So I'm like, okay, so then if you're not human, there's another option of being like a slave. If you're not human, you could also be divine. So there's this, that's what liminal people is. It's like, where are you at? Are you a slave? Are you divine? You know, and, and that's kind of what, what they're playing with. So the first book was liminal people. The second one, um, liminal war, is what happens when those fools start fighting. Um, and, and that's what goes on. And then entropy of bones is, um, is, is the secret to this young woman's martial arts skills, uh, the ability to find uh, the decay in the bones of all things. And that plays out in a broader sense in the final novel that doesn't have a title yet. Okay. Well, I love to read. I love love. Awesome. Whether fiction or nonfiction. Cool. I love history because those are the facts, those are the truth. And also, I love the Bible. I'm good at it. Cool. cool. See, human, we are born with something. We all have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to me, we, we all want to suffer. More or less, we all suffer. We have bad times, we also have good times. And uh, to me, you know, about human suffering, and someday I go to heaven and all the human suffering, mm -hmm. and all those injustices of injustice. Dr. Martin Jr. is a leader in the nation. I respect him. His speech is the one of the best. He took those journeys, he took the rest. Did you have a question? <laughs> yes. I agree with everything you said. The next, we have a, um, a question that was given to us on a card. Um, do you think it's hard to make it in the comic book industry as a person of color? And I would add to that as a novelist as well. Hell yeah. <laughs> Just cause, I mean, I, I was, man, they pulled this quote, I had this interview and they pulled this quote, they said, it's a great time to be a person of color in the comic book industry. I'm like, yeah, there's context to that. Um, I know, because people, I know people are looking at me like, yeah, for real, dude, for real? I've been trying to make my comic for like 15 years. This is what I think. Um, I think f if you're gonna sit there and wait for Marvel or DC or even Image or Dark Horse or whatever to look at you and tell you that you're good enough it's gonna be a long time till you get anything you want. Like it's just, and and I don't I, I don't know how you live your life, but in general, that that's how it is for people of color. That's how it is for any group that isn't the dominant minority. If you're sitting there waiting for people to tell you, fill in the blank, it's gonna be a while. If you are a maker, make. Like, I wrote the first book, The Liminal People, and I self-published it. And, you know, I had it, and yeah, you remember the little book, it was like this big, and, uh, you know, uh, took it to comic book shops, and took it to bookstores, and sold it by hand, and, you know, Nalo Hopkinson, who was just up here before, awesome, amazing friend of mine who I've known forever, she was like, hey, you should send that to these publishers, I think they might pick it up. Sent it to them, and they're like, yeah, good, go for it. Yeah, and tell us when you have another one. 
if I sat there and did the query letter and here are the first two chapters of the book and I hope you like it and bada 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 and here's some glitter in your letter or whatever, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. When I say it's a good time, what I mean is like for five grand, you can create your own book. I was listening to an interview with Robert Kirkman, the uh, creator of Walking Dead. That dude made like seven comics before he did Walking Dead, and like different series entirely. And what he did was he had a job where um, his boss would give him a payday advance. Please don't go to payday advance places in Oakland, they'll rip you off. But his boss would give him a payday advance, and the payday advance at the time was $1,500, and $1,500 was enough for him to print 500 comics. And so he printed the comics for 500 bucks, uh, for uh, 1,500 bucks if he made the same amount off of it, he got to pay back the loan and got a little bit extra. And he did like, first he got like 100 extra, then he got like 200 extra, and he lost some money sometimes, but he just kept doing the thing. You gotta just do the thing. Like whatever it is, just do it. And then you get better at it. And then as you get better at it, then maybe people will be like, oh, awesome. I'm a big publisher, I wanna do your thing with you. Or you're making enough money that you don't need them. Like, I, damn, I wish Bill Campbell was here. Uh, there's a publisher from Rosarian Publishing, um, Bill Campbell. That man, in the past three years, has started putting out some of the most awesome, amazing stuff. He's gonna be here tomorrow, you should totally check him out. Um, Bill just got on it, and Bill was like, this is what we're doing. And he started publishing digitally first, and then he started printing stuff. He's got the, uh, what is it, the Quantum Guide to Assimilated Santeria, I think that book is coming out. Like. It's on hit, but he did, it, he did it himself. So I'm all about getting it done yourself. That way you control it, you own it, you control your masters. We learned this from hip hop. Always control your masters. That's what I would say. Sorry for babbling. Next question. Yes. He gets everything from the TV series. That do, no, I mean, and that's the thing, like that's what we, like, you know, I'm from hip hop generation and we just didn't get it. We sold our masters to whomever, we've signed contracts, like owning different parts of an of a artist. Our, you remember Prince, remember why Prince changed his name? Prince changed his name because they had his name under contract. My man couldn't, couldn't make no money. He's like, okay, well, whoop, new name. So yeah, now this, now at this age, I'm like, control what you make, you know? I had a potential movie deal for liminal people, and like for no money, they wanted the rights to everything in perpetuity for forever and a day. I was like, I don't even know you like that. Like, <laughs> you know, like, buy me a drink first. Like, just don't just reach around like that. So, just, just saying. It's just, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to comment. You're so damn dope. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, damn, he is deep in physical and psychic and everything. I just want to express that because I just didn't want to just go to the Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. I'm nervous now. Come on, guys. <laughs> Oh, no worries. That's my job in life. <laughs> Hell yeah, I need some illustrators. Yeah, man. Give me your card. Serious. Um, I've been writing my whole life, but I was a very bad writer for most of my life. <laughs> like, seriously. Like, I look back at some of my early stuff and I was like, why did I do that? I had like a, a ninja that could lift 90 tons in the story. It was weird. It was really weird. I wrote like all this like weird, bad stuff, but like as a writer, I fully and honestly believe you have to get the bad stuff out. Like, you can't just sit there and, and expect that everything you put down on paper is gonna be great. Like, you just have to, just, just the worst stuff ever is just gonna come out. But in, in doing the writing, you're practicing. And you're seeing like, oh, 
that actually works. That line works, that this works, that that works. So um, yeah, I've been writing since I was seven years old, six, seven years old. I was, I'm dyslexic. Um, it looked like chicken scratch, like nobody liked what I wrote. Um, I kept writing it and I wrote in high school and it was weird because uh, I was working through issues. I was at a boarding school in New Hampshire. It was weird, weird stories. And then I wrote in college and was writing screenplays and they, some of them were okay, but they, a lot of them were very derivative. They looked like everybody else's stuff. And then I was living overseas for a little bit and started writing about what I saw there. And that was the first time I started being like, oh, I kind of like what I write. And then just kept writing and kept writing and kept writing. I've written like, like not even liminal people, I've written like five novels and I'm like none of them are ever gonna get published. So, you know, you just, you just put it out there and then just, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but you keep putting it out there. I got this note that says, should probably wrap up now. So what we're gonna do, <laughs> what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a quick, just, if we could do just some rapid fire questions, you know, some short questions, and then kind of wrap it up. Yes? All right, so we know that Sanan is a major intellectual uh, influence of yours. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you then draw or situate yourself in and construct your world with respect to being super rooted in intellectual concerns and super rooted in fantastical concerns? I tell a story. The story has to lead. Um, the the other stuff is is the is what's going on for me and my world as you see, the politics around me, but the most important thing for me is to stay on task, stay on plot, stay on character, stay on development, stay on conclusions, stay on denouement, all of it. Like story is what drives it. People don't wanna read my, if you wanna read my political statements, go on my Facebook page, you'll see tons of them. But if you wanna read a good story, then you pick up the novels. That's, that's where I stay focused on. I went to a boarding school in New Hampshire. Oh, New Hampshire. Yeah. And are you from kind of a literary family background? My family's literate. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't even mean it like that. What I meant was, what I meant was, my family. Um, I come. I come from reading people. Yeah, uh, you know, like, despite the disorder in my house growing up in terms of organization. There was, it was a, a stacks and stacks of books everywhere. And you could always pick up a book and read something. And you can ask my fiance in the back, it's the same problem now. There's stacks and stacks <laughs> of books everywhere. She's not too happy with that, but. Yeah. Is the third, I haven't read the third book yet. Is yeah. the third and the fourth book, are we gonna see any more of the guy who does the cross magic? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 totally, he's in there. Um, he's in the, he's not in the third book, he's in the final book. He's a big part of the final book. Yay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay, we got like two more questions. People who haven't asked a question. I feel like however you got, sorry, the question was, how do you um, pay, sorry, pay respects or how? Do, no, how, how do you learn from them? How do I learn from those who have come before me in terms of adjusting to this strange society? Um, I kind of, I look at all of it as whatever it takes to get through. Um, I'm a, f despite some people's opinions, I'm a fairly non-judgmental person. And however it takes, <laughs> And the, the, right, <laughs> the right people are laughing right now. Um, however, I'll speak specifically to African Americans. I, you know, that whole um, uh, slave, slave nigger, field nigger um, uh, dichotomy, I never fell for that. I was like, mm -mm. whatever it takes to get through. Like if you had, however you survived, good. Like, you survived, because I don't know who I came from, and I could have come from a bunch of field niggas, and I could have come from a bunch of house niggas. I don't care. They survived, and they gave me the option to make that choice for myself. So 
I don't, you know, my, that's why I say like my politics are a little different in that like everybody's like, you know, like a radical politic. I come from a radical political family and I've seen the consequences of that. I think the most political radical thing a black male can do is raise his kids. Like that, so as someone who like, you know, has grown up, grown up with their, you know, like grown up with a mother, nothing wrong with my mom, you know, but like, who has a dad who's incarcerated for political stuff, like it's not, you know, cool, that's a decision that he made, but like, there's consequences to that, you know? You got an entire, I mean, listen, listen to Odd Future. If you wanna hear the musical soundtrack for a generation of black males who didn't gr like grow up with their fathers, listen to Odd Future. They'll tell you everything you need to know. So whatever it takes to get through, I, I respect it and learn from it. Excuse me, um, excuse me, there's, you'd asked a question, you'd raise your hand earlier? Yes. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so here's, here's what I think about that. I think that our visions of the future have already been colonized, okay? So people are making this big thing about like, oh, look, there's a black guy in Star Wars. First of all, Lando. Second of all, I'm like, don't y'all remember Billy D? <laughs> <laughs> in Cloud City, running stuff? Yeah. Running, st anyway. So they're like, ah, oh, black guy in Star Wars, ah, ah, ah. And I'm like, why is there only one? Like, what, like, why is there only, because we, it's not like Hollywood is this like, this like meritocracy of story, right? They, there is an investment in a certain type of narrative that continues to perpetuate a certain type of political, social hegemony that dominates the world, right? And like the movie industry is an industry that is heteronormative. Oh my God, it's so heteronormative that if there is a bunch of aliens attacking the planet, all you have to do is have a white man and a white woman kiss each other, and then all of a sudden everything gets better. I'm serious, <laughs> Why, any movie. Any movie, watch any movie, you will see, it's all going on, we're not, we're not gonna be able to survive. No worry, baby, I got it. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> right? You're like, what, what, is that all it took? Is that all, right? So there are these certain like stories that like Hollywood needs to say again and again and again in order for it to work. White people are the norm, heterosexual people are the norm, People of color can play a support role and make sure that the white guy always wins. It's important that that story is told again and again and again for that industry to work. But that's not all story. And if you, that's what I like about novels is that it has more, they have more access for more stories to be told. So like about comics, more stories get to be told. But again, if we're looking for ourselves in Hollywood right now, best of luck, you know, like, keep looking, you'll find one or two and they'll be like, yay, and then it'll, then it'll die in the end, you know. <laughs> yes, I agree, all true. So um, I wanna do one last question because um, I want to. I want to hear. I want to hear a younger voice, because we haven't heard a young voice. Please ask your question. Hey. Have you ever given up and then started again, and then you went back a lot again? On a story? Yeah. Oh God, yeah. I like the one thing. Oh, sorry. The question was: Have you ever given up on a story, gone away from it, and then come back to it later? And actually, there's Nalo Hopkinson in the back, and she's uh, my awesome friend who I love dearly, more than life itself. And um, I remember when, I, before I was published at all, and then I was writing very bad stuff, um, and I told Nalo about something, and I said, yeah, I threw it away. And Nalo said, don't throw things away. Put them away. 
He's like, because if you throw it away, you can never see it again. But if you put it away, you can come back to it and look at it later. So if something, if, if I write something that I just absolutely can't stand, yeah, I'll put it away. And then there's a big trunk in the living room that has all the stuff that I don't really like. And then every now and then I'll open the trunk and look at it and be like, oh, no, that's a good sentence. And uh, the way I figure it, if, if I can pull a good sentence out of 10 pages, that's, a good, that's good writing. Well, on that note, I'd just like to uh, thank you all again yeah, for, your, thank uh, everybody. for your patience I appreciate and, it. and for your time.